troubling accusations against the prophet Joseph Smith were made by a young convert to the church named Martha Brotherton and in a letter attributed by the church to Joseph referred to as the happiness letter. Both have been employed in attempts to implicate Joseph in the practice of plural marriage. This presentation lays out what I think are the most likely explanations defending Joseph against the charges in both cases. While I try to make my videos stand alone, this video will make more sense if you watch my previously published videos on the origins of LDS polygamy in chronological order of publication, beginning with first LDS polygamist Joseph or Brigham, then Framing Joseph and Polygamy Killed Honesty. If this is the first video you've watched on this channel, it helps to understand that first, Joseph and Hiram Smith always taught against plural marriage in their verifiable public teachings and publications. Second, that Emma Smith claimed Joseph never had any other wife but her. Third, that Joseph only had children with Emma. No child from any of Joseph's alleged plural wives has ever been identified using DNA analysis. Fourth, that many church historical documents, including Joseph's journals, were altered to implicate Joseph Smith in polygamy after his death. And fifth, that DNC 132 emerged publicly for the first time in 1852, eight years after Joseph Smith's death under suspicious circumstances. Specifically, in this video, we'll analyze the account of Catherine Lewis and her claim of attempted recruitment into polygamy by Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball as it provides useful context for the Martha Brotherton allegations. Similarly, the document referred to as the Happiness Letter was created to induce Nancy Rigdon to accept plural marriage. None of these women accepted polygamy. Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball's clandestine recruitment of plural wives before Joseph Smith's death reveals a pattern of manipulation used in the grooming of targeted females. First, the concept of polygamy was introduced in secrecy reinforced by lies. After Joseph's death, they used temple oaths based on threats of physical violence to continue to hide their secret practices. Ideologically, the most common tactic seems to have been to encourage women to accept their proposals based on a desire to follow the prophet and thus God, which is why they had to make women believe the practice had originated with the prophet Joseph Smith which, as the evidence we've been considering in these videos indicates, it did not. Their tactics also included using women in the recruitment process, promises of great heavenly rewards in the afterlife, attempts to emotionally overwhelm targeted females by double-teaming them in private, and persistence to wear down opposition until targets felt like they had no other option but to concede and become a plural wife. Let's look at an example of this. In 1841, a woman named Catherine Lewis, a 42-year-old widow, joined the church in Massachusetts. She describes her introduction to the concept of polygamy as follows, quote, In the year 1841, I became acquainted with some of the Mormons, joined their church, and believed them to be a holy people, zealous of good works. Two years passed on. I was still strong in the faith until the plurality of wives was taught. I, from the first mention of it, opposed it and told the elder it was the doctrine of the devil but was sharply rebuked by one of the elders, who said, Ought we not to receive everything Joseph saith? No, said I, Joseph is a man subject to like passions as ourselves. Said the elder, This is a direct revelation immediately from heaven. I replied, I could not receive anything without a revelation for myself. The book of doctrine gave me this privilege, etc. I was then cautioned not to tell this conversation. I next heard the doctrine of plurality of wives was put down, and the teacher of it was under dealings in the church. So a comment here. As we've discussed in previous videos, in this time frame, the doctrine of plurality of wives was being repeatedly put down by both Joseph and Hiram Smith, who were actively preaching against what Hiram Smith referred to publicly as the, quote, damn fool doctrine of plural wives. And as a result, the elder that had introduced the concept to her had come under church discipline, which is what I think she means by the teacher of it was under dealings in the church. Anyway, continuing with her description, quote, Thus things went on well for a season, until one returned home who had been to Nauvoo. She sent for me, said she had something to tell me which was glorious. She, who, as we'll find out later, was Augusta Adams Cobb, Brigham Young's second plural wife, said she would tell me under the injunction of secrecy. I replied, I could not promise before knowing. After a little pause, she said, the plurality of wives is true, etc. 
I have brought an invitation to you from one of the twelve, and do not refuse, for you know not what you will lose if you do. If you are not satisfied with him, there are two others, and you can have your choice of either. They stand higher than he does, and if you take either of these, you will be highly exalted, and all your friends, both dead and living, will be benefited thereby. They professed this order would save the human family, dead or alive, and that it would bring the relatives of such as made the sacrifice forth in the first resurrection. I told her it did not look right, or words to that effect. She said, make it a subject of prayer and you will receive an evidence. I have an evidence in answer to prayer. My views on prayer are these. Some people set their hearts on things and pray for their desires. The Lord is pleased to give it unto them, as he did the quails unto the children of Israel. Now, she resumed, those two men are on their way here, one of whom expects an answer from you. In Augusta's high-pressure sales pitch, there was no courting love or even affection involved in the proposal, just a promise of high exaltation versus the fear of missing out on eternal blessings for her and her family if she said no. We have to ask ourselves, why was Augusta only recruiting for three of the twelve apostles and not for all of them? Two of those three, predictably or Brigham and Heber. She continues, quote, After considerable conversation on this subject, which it is useless to mention, she then said, If you tell anyone that I have told you these things, I will deny it and throw the lie on you. This I thought was a jest at first, but I soon learned they were commanded to lie if they were exposed, and they seek an opportunity when no other person is present to teach this doctrine, which, if divulged, they must deny. I saw her several times before the men came and told her my mind was confused and that I had no evidence it was right. She said, The reason you are so confused is because you have no head, for man is the head of woman. That is the way they pervert scripture to suit themselves. And many are deceived thereby. After some time, the men of whom we had been speaking came to Boston to attend the conference. I also went to the conference, and while there, one of these men, Heber C. Kimball, came in. He was introduced to me and commenced the conversation by asking if Sister Cobb had said anything to me on the subject of plurality of wives and wished to know my views, etc. I answered, Sister Cobb and I have conversed about this matter, but as yet I have no evidence that it is right. He said, you can have a few days to think it over. In conversation with him some days afterward, when, according to Heber's journal, Heber and Brigham went to Catherine Lewis's house and stayed until late into the night, the same subject was renewed. I told him my mind was as formerly. I did not, or could not, see it right for me to acquiesce in his opinions. He said, I am going to Baltimore. Expect to meet my wife. Shall bring her on here. That is Boston. You may see her. When you have talked with her, you will say, all is right. Whilst he was in Baltimore, news reached them of the death of Smith, which caused the twelve to hasten home. So the matter was postponed until I went to Nauvoo, end quote. What Catherine didn't know was that Heber didn't hasten home after hearing of the death of the prophet Joseph, but stayed behind with Brigham and Augusta Adams Cobb and married his second plural wife, which I covered in a previous video entitled Framing Joseph. Brigham's plural wife Augusta served as a recruiter for Brigham, Heber, and another unnamed member of the Twelve in their secret quest to acquire plural wives. Heber's plan to employ his wife Valate to convince the apprehensive widow Catherine Lewis implies that she, too, may have been involved. Catherine Lewis was interested in receiving the temple endowment. In her words, quote, If there was any good in this endowment, I wanted it. The elders taught publicly whoever went to Nauvoo and received an endowment in the temple would witness such a manifestation of the power of God, which could not be doubted. Under such representations, which I at the time believed, I felt anxious to obtain information for good, and accordingly made ready. The day after Catherine arrived in Nauvoo, Sister Cobb found out where Catherine was staying and visited her and later, quote, Mr. Kimball and Mr. Young called on me, end quote. Apostle Heber C. Kimball invited Catherine to live and work in his house, which she accepted. Of her stay there, she wrote, quote, I stayed 12 weeks and was treated respectfully by all the inmates. Mrs. K., meaning the late Kimball, Heber's legal wife, treated me as a sister. I think she would like to do right, but she is bound and must obey or suffer the penalty of their law. I was sitting in the room with Mrs. Kimball's sick babe in my arms when Mr. K., that is Heber C. Kimball, entered and commenced conversation on the subject of plurality of wives. He asked me how I felt about the matter now. I said, I have not as yet any evidence that it is right. He said, it is all right, and when the temple is done, my wife will come forward and give you to me, for she likes you. 
Some person then came in, which stayed the conversation for that time. The circumstance of Hagar came to mind, and I concluded never to become a Hagar. I afterwards told Mr. K. I wanted to talk with him on the subject. He evaded the question, but said, When the temple is done, you will be sent for, and all will be right. It seems like Heber believes he's cornered Catherine into becoming a plural wife, not because she accepted his proposal, but because she hasn't yet definitively turned him down, and by avoiding conversation to address her apprehension, he's effectively attempting to corral her into being sealed to him by not giving her a chance to air her concerns. He's emotionally trying to manipulate her into becoming a plural wife. Catherine Lewis, the author of this document, was not impressed with the endowment. After it was over, she explained that, quote, Mr. Kimball came to the room. Some other persons were then present. He, Kimball, asked if we understood the signs and was answered we did not. He explained them by placing his right thumb under the left ear and drawing across his throat to the right ear, said, This means you will have your throat cut from ear to ear if you divulge anything you have seen or heard in the temple. He then drew his left hand across his breast, saying, This signifies you must have your heart taken out, and immediately thrust his right arm down the right side, but did not explain. I afterwards learned it signified the ripping open of the bowels, tearing out the entrails, and the mangled body to be thrown into the river. Are not these hard sayings, said he? You are bound to obey the heads of the church, avenge the blood of your brethren every way possible, and strive to build up the kingdom. If you do not, you must suffer the penalties before mentioned. Maintaining a veil of secrecy over Brigham and Heber's polygamous activities was bolstered by death oaths once they began operating the temple. Heber's explanation of the ceremony Catherine and the others had just gone through, which they didn't understand before they were invited to participate, is that they were now obligated, in Heber's words, bound to obey the heads of the church or suffer the penalty of death by forcible removal of internal organs. This manipulative obligation of participants to unquestioningly obey leadership feels like an unwitting induction into a secret combination with disobedience punishable by death. Think about how difficult this would make it for Catherine or other women in her situation under these circumstances to withstand Heber's overtures. Many weren't able to withstand his advances. Catherine further explained, quote, Afterwards I was sent for and went to the temple to assist in making a covering for the altar to be used at the ceremony of the second part of the endowment. While there, one of the twelve, Kimball, came into the room where I was, the other women having left the room for a few minutes. Kimball drew a chair toward me, seated himself, and said, How do you feel now, sister, about matters? I replied, I have no evidence it is right. He said, It is all right. I feel right toward you, and so does my wife. And when this altar is done, the sealing will commence. My wife will come forward and give you to me, and all will be right, for she likes you, and will choose you for her associate. I shall take you to the West in the first company. You will always abide in my family, which will be a great blessing to you. I have a number of women but do not lodge with all. The probability is I shall with you. All this was said, and I had no opportunity of replying, for the door was opened, and one of the women came in. Kimball arose and went out. I had been previously selected to be one of Kimball's wives. End quote. My thought is that Apostle Kimball's presumptive close technique is a manipulative sales tactic employed to overpower those of lesser emotional strength. Continuing with Catherine's narrative, quote, from the time Mrs. Cobb first introduced the subject of plurality of wives until the time of which I am now writing, my mind was unsettled about it, for they had so much scripture intermixed and interpreted in such manner to make it appear right, it was almost impossible to refute their arguments. Besides, they professed immediate revelation from heaven and a commandment from God to take wives. But there was an article in the doctrines of the church that every person should have an evidence for him or herself, which article I ever claimed is my right. And when anything was said to me on this subject, my answer was, I have not the evidence that it is right for me. But things were approaching to a crisis. I was troubled in mind because I must soon say yea or nay to Kimball or some of his myrmidons or minions. Had they not claimed what is before stated, that is, an immediate revelation, and that by an angel, I should not have hesitated to have said as I did at first, it is the doctrine of the devil. My spirits became depressed, lest these things should be as they represented them. And if I said nay, I might be found raising my voice against the Lord's anointed, which to my mind was no small thing. In conversation with Kimball afterwards on the subject, he evaded my questions, turned the conversation upon something else. I therefore wrote a letter addressed to him, explaining my views, and expected an answer. But none has been received from that day to this. 
I know not of any letters being written by any of the apostles on this subject, since the notorious letter to Nancy Rigdon, which incidentally is the happiness letter we will address later. Continuing with the quote, For fear of further exposure, Kimball probably thought by not writing my mind would be troubled, therefore giving him the advantage over me. His silence caused me still further to doubt, for had they received such a commandment of such importance as the salvation of my own soul and that of all my ancestors, it was their duty as servants of the Most High to have informed me. I had left Kimball's house but lived in the neighborhood. About three weeks after I had sent the letter, I went to Kimball's house to work. When Heber C. Kimball said, Sister, how do you feel about matters now? You do not feel so well since you sent me that letter. I replied, You are mistaken. It relieved my mind and I feel much better. No more was said at that time, for others were in the room. End quote. After continued uncertainty, Catherine decided to leave Nauvoo. Catherine continues, quote, I kept my own counsel and said not a word until a few days previous to my departure, and then, as I thought, only to a few friends. When it became known that I was about to go, Mrs. Cobb came to see me. She seemed troubled and asked to see me alone. I went with her into another room. She said, I have come with the word of the Lord, and do not resist counsel, sister. If you do, you know not what you will lose. I replied, I shall resist such counsel which does not suit me. She said, I have come to beg of you not to leave this place without having your full endowment. I said, I have no one to go through with. She named Kimball, Brigham Young, and a number of others, but to each of these I objected. She asked, Is there no one you will take? I answered, No, if I cannot be saved without, I will be damned. Therefore, you need say no more. She asked me to call on her before I went away, and frequent inquiries were made to ascertain the exact time and manner of my going. I went away without their knowledge, and from what I have since learned without their consent, for it is my firm opinion, had they known my exact departure, means would have been used to waylay or otherwise maltreat me in order to prevent my escape. But a snowstorm was providentially the means of my deliverance. I arrived safely at St. Louis. After staying there less than a month, Mrs. Cobb made her appearance at my house. She said to me, You missed a good chance. One of the brethren and his wife were going to Warsaw to take the boat. They would have carried you for nothing and saved expense. But you went away so privately, they did not know you were going until the night before you left. She continued, I hastened early in the morning to see you, but you were gone. I have no doubt this was a plan and a snare to entrap me because these persons of whom she spoke remained in Nauvoo for some length of time after I left. Her language opened my eyes to see what a wonderful and narrow escape I had made, and I could look back and see many times my life had been in danger, for something seemed mysterious. When Mrs. Cobb called to see me in St. Louis, she brought another woman with her. I did not care to say much. They talked of those glorious things, the spiritual wife doctrine. The women thought it was spiritual, nothing literal but the ceremony, etc. After hearing them some time, I said, In my opinion, it is damnable heresy in the doctrine of devils. They were both speechless for some time. News was brought me at St. Louis, stating a letter had been received at Boston from Nauvoo, in which I was called an apostate. This was done to prevent any influence I might have had amongst them on my return. They threatened to excommunicate any member who visited, talked, or listened to, or with an apostate, because such, they say, are unworthy of belief. End quote. The cultural and emotional subjugation of women in the church was manifested in the practices employed to induce women to participate in polygamy. A decade later, Heber's teachings reinforced the same views of unequal male-female relationships. Discussing his worthiness requirements for women and children to partake of the sacrament, he taught in the tabernacle, quote, I do not consider that one of my wives or one of my children has a right to partake of these emblems, meaning the sacrament, until they make a full and proper restitution to me if they have offended me. Why is this? Because I am their head, I am their governor, their dictator, their revelator, their prophet and their priest. And if they rebel against me, they at once raise a mutiny in my family. In the same talk, Heber also taught, quote, I have no wife nor child that has any right to rebel against me. If they violate my laws and rebel against me, they will get into trouble, just as quickly as though they transgress the counsels and teachings of Brother Brigham. Does it give a woman a right to sin against me because she is my wife? No, but it is her duty to do my will as I do the will of my Father and my God. It is the duty of a woman to be obedient to her husband, and unless she is, I would not give a damn for all her queenly right and authority, nor for her either, if she will quarrel and lie about the work of God and the principle of plurality. End quote. That's from a talk Heber would have approved for publication in the Journal of Discourses. That brings us to the curious case of Martha Brotherton. 
Martha was an attractive 17-year-old convert who'd emigrated from England to the Nauvoo area with her family in 1841. She claimed that three weeks after her arrival, Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball tried to convince her to become a secret wife to Brigham, and when she refused, the two senior apostles brought a man they identified as the prophet Joseph to try to convince her. She continued to reject the proposal and six weeks later left town with her parents. Joseph publicly claimed that her accusations, which initially implicated his brother Hiram Smith rather than himself in the seduction plot, were a lie. Some of Martha's family would support her claims, while her sister, who ironically would later become a plural wife to Parley P. Pratt, thought Martha had lied. Martha's story appeared in newspapers across the country. This drawing depicts her rejection of Brigham Young's solicitation. I'll explain why I think her account credibly describes Brigham and Heber's involvement, while inaccurately accusing the Prophet Joseph. This image, when originally published, was captioned, quote, the defiance of Martha Brotherton. It might seem easy to write off Martha's accusations as libel, except for a crucial plot twist nearly 20 years later, when Brigham Young had Martha Brotherton sealed to him as a wife after she had supposedly treacherously accused Brigham of attempted adulterous seduction, left the church, married another man, and then passed away. Why would Brigham want to formally link himself with an apostate ex-Mormon who'd accused him in newspapers across the country? Brigham's sealing to Martha gives us reason to believe that there may have been some truth in her assertions. Given what we know about Brigham and Heber, her story is not far-fetched. But the claim that the prophet Joseph worked alongside Brigham and Heber stands in opposition to everything we can prove Joseph taught and published publicly. Several crucial pieces of evidence lead me to believe that Brigham and Heber involved a third man that impersonated either Joseph or Hiram Smith in their attempt to persuade Martha to become a secret wife to Brigham. Let's look at the evidence. In November 1841, Martha's family arrives in Illinois. Just three weeks later, during which time Brigham and Heber visited the Brotherton family multiple times in their new residence, Brigham and Heber propositioned Martha. By the next month, January 1842, it was noted that Martha's father was publicly circulating the story of Brigham's attempted seduction of his daughter, and church members back in England were being warned to ignore his accusations. In the February-March time frame of 1842, Martha and her parents leave town after exposing Brigham's attempt to seduce Martha. Two months later, persistent rumors about what happened are a big enough deal that in the April conference, Joseph addresses them publicly. He denounces rumors that Brigham, Heber, and Hiram Smith had been involved in propositioning Martha. Joseph did not defend himself, as it appears that at that point he had not yet been implicated in the rumors. Hiram and Joseph's mention of the incident in the April 1842 conference reads as follows. He, meaning Hiram Smith, then spoke in contradiction of a report in circulation about Elder Kimball, B. Young, himself, and others of the Twelve, alleging that a sister had been shut in a room for several days and that they had endeavored to induce her to believe in having two wives. Also cautioned the sisters against going to the steamboats. President J. Smith spoke upon the subject of the stories respecting Elder Kimball and others, showing the folly and inconsistency of spending any time in conversing about such stories or hearkening to them, for there is no person that is acquainted with our principles would believe such lies except Sharp, the editor of the Warsaw Signal. Here we see that the early version of Martha Brotherton's accusations specifically identified Heber C. Kimball, Brigham Young, and Hiram Smith, as well as other unnamed apostles. This indicates that Joseph had no idea about what Brigham and Heber were doing behind his back, and that he still trusted them. Three months later, in July of 1842, John C. Bennett, the disgraced sexual predator and ex-mayor of Nauvoo, publishes an affidavit from Martha that claims Joseph, rather than Hiram, was the Smith brother that had been involved. Language in the affidavit lends credence to the possibility that Brigham and Heber had someone impersonate Hiram or Joseph in their attempt to convince Martha. It's interesting that the next year, in June 1843, a cryptic entry in William Clayton's journal indicates that an individual identified only as B.Y., who was almost certainly Brigham Young, was identified by the Prophet Joseph as having, quote, transgressed his covenant, end quote, and that if Joseph hadn't intervened directly with the Lord, Brigham's life would have been taken as a consequence. This serious transgression may have involved Brigham's attempt to seduce Martha Brotherton. Clayton's journal entry also states that Brigham denied wrongdoing. For context, when the Brotherton family came on boat from New Orleans headed toward Nauvoo, the Mississippi River was too low for them to continue past Warsaw, which is about 20 miles south of Nauvoo. B. 
Because Nauvoo was growing quickly and finding a place to live there could be difficult, Martha's family initially found a place to stay in Warsaw. Martha's older sister Mary lived in Nauvoo with her husband John McElwick, and Martha's encounter with Brigham happened while Martha was staying at her sister Mary's residence in Nauvoo a few weeks after arriving. Eventually, Martha Brotherton and her parents moved to Nauvoo because they were recorded in a census there in February. It appears that shortly thereafter, the Brothertons left Nauvoo to return to Warsaw and eventually to St. Louis. Martha Brotherton's affidavit, created in St. Louis in July of 1842 and written to John C. Bennett, reads, quote, I had been at Nauvoo near three weeks, during which time my father's family received frequent visits from elders Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball, two of the Mormon apostles, when, early one morning, they both came to my brother-in-law's, John McElwick's house, at which place I then was on a visit, and particularly requested me to go and spend a few days with them. I told them I could not at that time, as my brother-in-law was not at home. However, they urged me to go the next day and spend one day with them. The day being fine, I accordingly went. When I arrived at the foot of the hill, Young and Kimball were standing conversing together. They both came to me, and after several flattering compliments, Kimball wished me to go to his house first. I said it was immaterial to me, and accordingly went. We had not, however, gone many steps when Young suddenly stopped and said he would go to that brother's, pointing to a log hut a few yards distant, and tell him that you, speaking to Kimball and Brother Glover, or Glover, I do not remember which, will value his land. When he had gone, Kimball turned to me and said, Martha, I want you to say to my wife when you go to my house that you want to buy some things at Joseph's store, Joseph Smith's, and I will say I am going with you to show you the way. You know you want to see the prophet, and you will then have an opportunity. I made no reply. Young again made his appearance, and the subject was dropped. There are some observations that I think are worth noting here. The first is that Heber appears to be grooming Martha by trying to involve her in lying to his wife. In the dialogue, Heber says, quote, Martha, I want you to say to my wife when you go to my house that you want to buy some things at Joseph's store, and I will say I am going with you to show you the way. From a historical perspective, three weeks after Martha's arrival would date her interaction with Brigham and Heber roughly halfway through December of 1841, when Joseph Smith's store wasn't yet open to the public. Joseph would open the store to the public a few weeks later on January 5th, 1842. It's worth noting that as the store was not yet open to the public, it makes sense that Joseph wouldn't necessarily have been at the store that day. What Heber reportedly said to her next is even more important because it indicates that Martha had not yet met Joseph, meaning she wouldn't have known what he looked like. Heber said, quote, You know you want to see the prophet, and you will then have an opportunity. Martha didn't know what Joseph looked like, and Brigham and Heber knew that. Continuing with Martha's affidavit, quote, We soon reached Kimball's house, where Young took his leave, saying, I shall see you again, Martha. I remained at Kimball's near an hour when Kimball, seeing that I would not tell the lies he wished me to, told them to his wife himself. He then went and whispered in her ear, and asked if that would please her. Yes, she said, or I can go along with you and Martha. No, said he, I have some business to do, and I will call for you afterwards to go to the debate, meaning the debate between yourself, Dr. Bennett, and Joseph. To this she consented. So Kimball and I went to the store together. As we were going along, he said, Sister Martha, are you willing to do all that the prophet requires you to do? I said I believed I was, thinking, of course, you would require nothing wrong. Then, said he, are you ready to take counsel? I answered in the affirmative, thinking of the great and glorious blessings that had been pronounced upon my head, if I adhered to the counsel of those placed over me in the Lord. Well, said he, there are many things revealed in these last days that the world would laugh and scoff at, but unto us is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. He further observed, Martha, you must learn to hold your tongue, and it will be well with you. You will see Joseph, and very likely have some conversation with him, and he will tell you what you shall do. When we reached the building, Joseph's store, he led me up some stairs to a small room, the door of which was locked, and on it the following inscription, positively no admittance. He observed, Ah! Brother Joseph must be sick, for strange to say, he is not here. Come down into the tithing office, Martha. He then left me in the tithing office and went out, I know not where. In this office were two men writing, one of whom, William Clayton, I had seen in England, the other I did not know. Young came in and seated himself before me and asked where Kimball was. I said he had gone out. He said it was all right. Soon after, Joseph came in and spoke to one of the clerks and then went upstairs, followed by Young. Immediately after, Kimball came in. Now, Martha, said he, the prophet has come. Come upstairs. I went, and we found Young and the prophet alone. I was introduced to the prophet by Young. 
Joseph offered me his seat, and to my astonishment, the moment I was seated, Joseph and Kimball walked out of the room and left me with Young, who arose, locked the door, closed the windows, and drew the curtain. This almost theatrical series of events, in which Kimball announces, quote, The prophet has come, come upstairs, rather than simply introducing Martha to the man impersonating Joseph in the tithing office, who then, once they are all upstairs, offers Martha his chair before quickly leaving the room without saying anything about the still unclear subject of the charade, appears in an attempt to convey Joseph's approval of Brigham's forthcoming pitch while awkwardly avoiding any discussion on the topic. So Brigham and Heber's prearranged plan appears to be that someone they would pretend was Joseph was going to be at the store and tell Martha what to do. Continuing with Martha's affidavit, quote, he, meaning Brigham, then came and sat before me and said, this is our private room, Martha. Indeed, sir, said I, I must be highly honored to be permitted to enter it. He smiled and then proceeded, Sister Martha, I want to ask you a few questions. Will you answer them? Yes, sir, said I, and will you promise not to mention them to anyone? If it is your desire, sir, said I, I will not. And you will not think any worse of me for it, will you, Martha, said he? No, sir, I replied. Well, said he, what are your feelings towards me? I replied, my feelings are just the same towards you that they ever were, sir. But to come to the point more closely, said he, have you not an affection for me that were it lawful and right you could accept of me for your husband and companion? My feelings at that moment were indescribable. God only knows them. What, thought I, are these men that I thought almost perfection itself, deceivers? And is all my fancied happiness but a dream? Twas even so. But my next thought was, which is the best way for me to act at this time? If I say no, they may do as they think proper. And to say yes, I never would. So I considered it best to ask for time to think and pray about it. I therefore said, if it was lawful and right, perhaps I might. But you know, sir, it is not. Brigham's decision to have Martha sealed to him after his death lends credibility to the legitimacy of this dialogue. A man who was attracted to Martha and tried to convince her to be sexual with him is consistent with a man who would years later try to lay claim on her in the afterlife using priesthood power which he claimed to possess. Continuing with the quote, Well, but, said he, Brother Joseph has had a revelation from God, not yet written down, that it is lawful and right for a man to have two wives. For as it was in the days of Abraham, so shall it be in these last days, and whoever is the first that is willing to take up the cross will receive the greatest blessings. And if you will accept of me, I will take you straight to the celestial kingdom. So here we see evidence that Brigham was invoking an unwritten revelation in late 1841. This fictitious revelation describing the blessings of Abraham would formally come to life years later after Joseph received a real but very different revelation on marriage in 1843 that Brigham would later co-opt and revise to create what we know as DNC 132. Also, we see the tactic used with Martha that Brigham claimed he was somehow qualified through his position as an apostle to be able to take a new 17-year-old secret wife straight to the celestial kingdom that would later be used on other women, as we have seen in this and other videos. Brigham continues, quote, And if you will have me in this world, I will have you in that which is to come, and Brother Joseph will marry us here today, and you can go home this evening, and your parents will not know anything about it. Sir, said I, I should not like to do anything of the kind without the permission of my parents. Well, but, said he, you are of age, are you not? No, sir, said I, I shall not be until the 24th of May. Well, said he, that does not make any difference. You will be of age before they know, and you need not fear. If you will take my counsel, it will be well with you, for I know it to be right before God. And if there is any sin in it, I will answer for it. But Brother Joseph wishes to have some talk with you on the subject. He will explain things. Will you hear him? I do not mind, said I. Well, but I want you to say something, said he. I want time to think about it, said I. Well, said he, I will have a kiss anyhow, and then rose and said he would bring Joseph. He then unlocked the door and took the key and locked me up alone. He was absent about ten minutes and then returned with Joseph. Well, said Young, Sister Martha would be willing if she knew it was lawful and right before God. Well, Martha, said Joseph, it is lawful and right before God. I know it is. Look here, sis, don't you believe in me? I did not answer. Well, Martha, said Joseph, just go ahead and do as Brigham wants you to. He is the best man in the world except me. Oh, said Brigham, then you are as good. Yes, said Joseph. Well, said Young, we believe Joseph to be a prophet. I have known him near eight years and always found him the same. Yes, said Joseph, and I know that this is lawful and right before God, and if there is any sin in it, I will answer for it before God. And I have the keys of the kingdom, and whatever I bind on earth is bound in heaven, and whatever I loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And if you will accept of Brigham, you shall be blessed. 
God shall bless you, and my blessing shall rest upon you. And if you will be led by him, you will do well, for I know Brigham will take care of you. And if he don't do his duty to you, come to me, and I will make him. And if you do not like it, in a month or two, come to me, and I will make you free again. And if he turns you off, I will take you on. Sir, said I rather warmly, it will be too late to think in a month or two after. I want time to think first. Well, but, said he, the old proverb is, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And it would be the greatest blessing that was ever bestowed upon you. Yes, said Young, and you will never have reason to repent it, that is, if I do not turn from righteousness, and that I trust I never shall, for I believe God, who has kept me so long, will continue to keep me faithful. Did you ever see me act in a wrong way in England, Martha? No, sir, said I. No, said he, neither can anyone else lay anything to my charge. Well then, said Joseph, what are you afraid of, sis? Come, let me do the business for you. Sir, said I, do let me have a little time to think about it, and I will promise not to mention it to anyone. Well, but look here, said he, you know a fellow will never be damned for doing the best he knows how. Well then, said I, the best way I know of is to go home and think and pray about it. Well, said Young, I shall leave it with Brother Joseph, whether it would be best for you to have time or not. Well, said Joseph, I see no harm in her having time to think, if she will not fall into temptation. Oh, sir, said I, there is no fear of falling into temptation. Well, but, said Brigham, you must promise you will never mention it to anyone. I do promise it, said I. Well, said Joseph, you must promise me the same. I promised him the same. Upon your honor, said he, you will not tell? No, sir, I will lose my life first, said I. Well, that will do, said he. That is the principle we go upon. I think I can trust you, Martha, said he. Yes, said I, I think you ought. Joseph said she looks as if she could keep a secret. I then rose to go when Joseph commenced to beg of me again. He said it was the best opportunity they might have for months, for the room was often engaged. I, however, was determined what to do. Well, said Young, I will see you tomorrow. I am going to preach at the schoolhouse opposite your house. I have never preached there yet. You will be there, I suppose. Yes, said I, end quote. One interesting note on this portion of dialogue is the quote, when Joseph commenced to beg of me again, he said it was the best opportunity they might have for months, for the room was often engaged. This seems like something someone would say if they knew Joseph was going to be away from the store for the day and didn't know if the room would be available again. It doesn't sound like something Joseph would say because it was Joseph's building and he could clear the room any time he wanted to. It makes more sense that somebody impersonating Joseph would employ this reasoning than it does that Joseph would need to say something like that. Martha finishes, quote, the next day being Sunday, I sat down instead of going to meeting and wrote the conversation and gave it to my sister, who was not a little surprised. But she said it would be best to go to meeting in the afternoon. We went, and Young administered the sacrament. After it was over, I was passing out, and Young stopped me, saying, Wait, Martha, I am coming. I said, I cannot. My sister is waiting for me. He then threw his coat over his shoulders and followed me out and whispered, Have you made up your mind, Martha? Not exactly, sir, said I, and we parted. I shall proceed to a justice of the peace and make oath to the truth of these statements, and you are at liberty to make what use of them you may think best. Yours respectfully, Martha H. Brotherton. While John C. Bennett could have altered Martha's original statement, as he certainly seems to have had no problem fabricating lies to accuse Joseph of polygamy, I think it's more likely Brigham and Heber employed somebody to impersonate Joseph, or Hiram, as the original rumor claimed. Given the similarities between the Catherine Lewis and Martha Brotherton accounts, and Brigham's use of similar tactics elsewhere, a pattern of promises emerges that ties the narratives together. As Augusta Adams Cobb, Brigham's second plural wife, claimed to Catherine Lewis, quote, and if you take either of these, you will be highly exalted, and all your friends, both dead and living, will be benefited thereby, is similar to Brigham's claim to Martha Brotherton, quote, I will take you straight to the celestial kingdom, which is reminiscent of Brigham's claim to Zina D. Huntington that, quote, President Young told Zina D. if she would marry him, she would be in a higher glory. Joseph could honestly and earnestly deny the legitimacy of Martha's accusations because he and Hiram were not involved, and he trusted Brigham and Heber that they had not been involved either. This letter published by, quote, the sister of Martha Brotherton in the church's publication, The Millennial Star in England, in August of 1842, which was an attempt to counteract Martha Brotherton's accusations, is interesting, as it appears to have been written by Martha's sister, Elizabeth, who came over on the same boat with Martha and their parents just a few months before. She appears to have stayed in Warsaw when her parents and Martha moved to Nauvoo, albeit briefly, earlier that year. She says something interesting in the first lines of the letter, quote, We arrived here, meaning Nauvoo, three weeks ago, which, given the April 20th date, means she would have arrived in late March. Now, this is the important part. 
I thought I would not write until I had seen the prophet and attended the meetings in Nauvoo. Think about that for a moment. If Martha's sister Elizabeth had been living in Warsaw through the end of March 1842 and had never seen the prophet Joseph in person, it seems much more plausible that Martha, who left Nauvoo for Warsaw with her parents sometime around February 1841, may have never seen the prophet Joseph face to face to have been able to recognize that the person Brigham and he were introduced as Joseph was actually somebody else. If Brigham's solicitation of Martha occurred in December of 1841, and she told her parents soon after it occurred, it's not unreasonable to think that they would have stopped attending church meetings soon thereafter. That's why I think it's quite possible that Martha never met or even saw the real Joseph Smith. Martha's unnamed sister continues, quote, I suppose by this time you will have heard that my parents and sister have apostatized. I know not what they have written to England, as they would not let me see their letters, but I can prove that my sister has told some of the greatest lies that ever were circulated. If it indeed was Martha's sister Elizabeth who wrote this letter, it's quite ironic that within a year or two she would become the first polygamous wife of Parley P. Pratt. As I've tried to demonstrate in my videos on polygamy, it's evidence quality that matters most. As we scrutinize the trustworthiness of evidence used to implicate Joseph Smith in polygamy, we observe that the church's standard of evidentiary quality has been surprisingly low. Take, for example, Elder Holland's use of a quote attributed to the prophet Joseph that appeared in the September 2017 ensign, quote, in a phrase I am sure you have heard many times before, the prophet Joseph Smith once said, happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. Elder Holland is sure we've heard this quote many times because it's been shared repeatedly. For example, in the October 2000 First Presidency message, President Faust invoked the same reference, quote, as the prophet Joseph Smith told us, Happiness is the object and design of our existence, etc. President Faust's source for the quote was the once popular book, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. While the quote itself is innocuous, its presence is evidence of church historians using spurious sources to implicate Joseph in the practice of polygamy. The actual source of the quote is ironically one of Joseph Smith's greatest public enemies, John C. Bennett. In addition, it was publicly known in Joseph's day that the Prophet Joseph Smith denied authorship of the quote. There are at least nine issues with the attribution of the happiness letter to the Prophet Joseph. First, the story originated with John C. Bennett, a known liar and enemy of the Prophet Joseph. Two, there is no physical copy of the letter to examine for clues about its provenance. Third, the letter wasn't dated. Fourth, the contents of the letter weren't addressed to anyone. Fifth, Joseph's signature or even name weren't included in or used anywhere in the anonymous letter. Sixth, John C. Bennett claimed the letter was in the handwriting of Willard Richards. Seventh, Sidney Rigdon claimed the letter had not come from the prophet Joseph, and through her father, Nancy Rigdon publicly denied that the letter came from Joseph. Eighth, Joseph Smith's brother, Apostle William Smith, declared publicly at the time through his Nauvoo newspaper, The Wasp, that Joseph was not the author of the letter. And ninth, church history was changed years after Joseph's death to legitimize the letter. If you're interested, this well-researched paper written by an assistant professor of church history and doctrine at BYU identifies issues with the so-called happiness letter. The happiness letter, as it's come to be known, came from a letter that John C. Bennett, the disgraced ex-mayor of Nauvoo, produced in a letter published by the Sangamo Journal newspaper on August 19, 1842, which he claimed Joseph wrote to Nancy Rigdon, the 19-year-old daughter of First Presidency Counselor Sidney Rigdon, trying to convince her to become his plural wife. Here we see the familiar words, happiness is the object and design of our existence, which are the opening words from the letter. And here we see Bennett's snarky attribution of the letter to Joseph, quote, thus reads the prophet Joe's love letter to Miss Rigdon. To understand it, I refer you to the spiritual wife doctrine heretofore alluded to and to Miss Brotherton's letter, end quote, which is the Martha Brotherton letter we reviewed previously. Bennett was also responsible for publishing the Martha Brotherton letter in this same time frame. Eight days after Bennett's allegations were published in The Wasp, a newspaper run by Joseph Smith's brother, Apostle William Smith, this editorial was published in response, quote, The sixth letter is what purports to be a copy of a letter from Joseph Smith to Miss Nancy Rigdon without date, name, or proof. In summary, it states, Joseph Smith is not the author. That same day, Sidney Rigdon wrote this letter published in the next edition of The Wasp on September 3, 1842, which reads, quote, Editor of the Wasp, Dear Sir, I am fully authorized by my daughter Nancy to say to the public through the medium of your paper that the letter which has appeared in the Sangamo Journal, making part of General Bennett's letters to said paper, 
purporting to have been written by Mr. Joseph Smith to her, was unauthorized by her, and that she never said to General Bennett or any other person that said letter was written by Mr. Smith, nor in his handwriting, but by another person and in another person's handwriting. I would further state that Mr. Smith denied to me the authorship of that letter, Sidney Rigdon, end quote. Joseph's brother, Apostle William Smith, publicly claimed that Joseph did not write the letter, and then Sidney Rigdon, Joseph's counsel in the First Presidency, clearly declared publicly that Joseph had denied authorship of the letter to him. This quote from the paper referenced previously reinforces the point, quote, Though written for the Wasp, Sidney Rigdon's denial was actually first published in a special Times and Seasons publication entitled Affidavits and Certificates Disproving the Statements and Affidavits Contained in John C. Bennett's Letters on August 31, 1842. It was published four days later in the Wasp as well, with the addition of a postscript directed at the papers that had published Bennett's claims connecting Nancy Rigdon to the letter and asking them to publish the denial as an act of justice to Miss Rigdon, end quote. In summary, it was made abundantly clear to members and leaders of the church at the time that Joseph denied John C. Bennett's accusation about the prophet's involvement in the Nancy Rigdon happiness letter. That's why it's so hard to understand how the church can justify their allegation that Joseph didn't deny authorship of the letter. The quote in blue from the Joseph Smith Papers website claims, quote, As in the cases of most of his, meaning Joseph Smith's, verifiable plural marriages, Joseph Smith was silent about this issue, neither confirming nor denying either his authorship of the letter or the allegation that he approached Nancy Rigdon to be a plural wife. That simply isn't the case. Joseph clearly denied authorship of the letter to his first counsel in the first presidency, Sidney Rigdon, who declared it publicly. It seems the church has to lean on this type of unjustifiable claim because the prospects of having to admit that church leaders have been falsely attributing to Joseph words he didn't write may be too painful to consider. To be clear, from my perspective, there isn't even one verifiable instance of the prophet Joseph engaging in or even tolerating plural marriage. A reference to Sidney Rigdon's letter denying Joseph's involvement in the happiness letter was originally included in the church's history for August 27, 1842, the day Rigdon wrote the letter. But for unknown reasons, a different clerk in 1855, over a decade after Joseph Smith's death, removed Rigdon's letter from the history of the church and inserted in its place the text of the happiness letter. And the legitimacy of the letter has largely gone unquestioned since. The change was made public in the Deseret News serial publication of The History of Joseph Smith in December of 1855. Eleven years after Joseph's death, regardless of the fact that both Apostle William Smith and First Presidency Counselor Sidney Rigdon had publicly declared that Joseph did not write the letter, Without explanation or even attribution, the quote-unquote happiness letter, which begins, quote, happiness is the object and design of our existence, was inappropriately inserted into church history and has since been presented as evidence that Joseph Smith did proposition the 19-year-old Nancy Rigdon to become a plural wife. I don't think that Elder Faust or Elder Holland had any idea that they were quoting spurious teachings incorrectly attributed to the prophet Joseph, but this is an example of the low-quality evidence used to support the assertion that the prophet Joseph introduced and practiced polygamy. There's one additional piece of evidence we ought to consider from 1842. To further counter John C. Bennett's claims, on October 1st, 1842, about a month after Sidney Rigdon's letter appeared in print, the church's newspaper, The Times and Seasons, published the church's law regarding marriage found in section 101 of the 1835 version of the Doctrine and Covenants, which reads in part, quote, inasmuch as this church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman but one husband, except in case of death, when either is at liberty to marry again. This was followed by 12 male members of the church, including John Taylor and Wilford Woodruff, who attested that they, quote, know of no other rule or system of marriage than the one published from the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, and we give this certificate to show that Dr. J.C. Bennett's secret wife system is a creature of his own make, as we know of no such society in this place, nor never did. Similarly, 19 female members of the Relief Society attested that, quote, we know of no system of marriage being practiced in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints save the one contained in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, end quote. I believe that these members honestly made these attestations at the time. Years later, some of those who signed these certificates changed their claims. Many years later, Eliza R. Snow would claim that three months earlier she had been married or sealed to Joseph Smith and Elizabeth Ann Whitney, wife of Newell K. Whitney, would change her story over 25 years later and claim that her daughter had been, quote, married or sealed to Joseph a few months earlier in July of 1842. There's no question that Eliza R. Snow and Elizabeth Ann Whitney, both serving in the newly formed Relief Society presidency, lied. 
The only question is when they lied. I believe they were telling the truth in this instance, in 1842, and lied in 1869 when the church manufactured significant amounts of evidence to implicate Joseph in the practice of polygamy. The bottom line is there's no question Joseph Smith's public stance on John C. Bennett's accusations was that Joseph denied Bennett's charges and clearly asserted that Bennett was lying. And that's why the church has changed 13 years later to attribute the spurious happiness letter to Joseph Smith is shockingly inappropriate. There's one last historical aspect worth considering. It's interesting that John C. Bennett would claim that the happiness letter, written around April of 1842, was in Willard Richards' handwriting because letters Apostle Richards wrote to his wife in that same time frame expressed themes similar to those found in the happiness letter. For example, the happiness letter read, quote, happiness is the object and design of our existence. That which is wrong under one circumstance may be and often is right under another. So with Solomon, things which might be considered abominable to all who do not understand the order of heaven, everything that God gives us is lawful and right. Compare that to what Willard Richards wrote to his wife, Janetta, at the end of February 1842, that, quote, If you will cling to me and seek my happiness to the end, I will bring you into the kingdom and your friends and mine. Willard added, in an undated letter likely from the same time frame, that, quote, Always remember, God never instituted an order of things which would not tend to the happiness of his children. Also, in his February 26th letter to Janetta, he wrote, quote, There are many things recorded of the old patriarchs and prophets which have seemed bad to us, which if we knew the reasons thereof and the order of God would appear right. And the grand secret of the gospel is this, for us to live by every word of the Lord, to live by revelation, present revelation, do what God requires of us, not what he required of somebody else. I think it's most likely that Willard wrote the letter and that Joseph had nothing to do with it. Less than a year after writing that letter to his wife, Willard Richards, Brigham Young's first cousin, polygamously married 16- and 14-year-old sisters, although it appears he didn't consummate those marriages for several years. In March of 1845, Willard, his wife Janetta, and their son Heber John sat for this daguerreotype photo. Less than four months later, Janetta, who had struggled with poor health, passed away at just 27 years of age. Their son Heber John always maintained that his mother died of a broken heart. A great irony of the quote-unquote happiness letter is that the purported happiness of polygamy was so one-sided in favor of the male participants. According to one biographer, Augusta Adams Cobb's relationship with Brigham Young began to sour when she learned she was Brigham's second plural wife and not the first, as she had been led to believe. In Augusta's first known letter written to Brigham while still in Nauvoo, Augusta had already soured on the benefits of plural marriage. She wrote to Brigham, quote, I hasten to communicate a few lines to you this morning to say that I cannot come up to the temple this evening with the girls, meaning the other plural wives. The Spirit of the Lord forbids why I know not, but I believe I soon shall. One thing I do know, which is I could never be yours in the position you have placed me, for I must have a companion. God knows my heart and knows that I can never be happy in that situation, meaning in polygamy. In 1848, Brigham canceled their eternal sealing and had Augusta sealed to the deceased, Joseph Smith. Once again, I believe Joseph Smith was a prophet and that he did not practice or promote polygamy. The church's acceptance of the happiness letter unfairly makes Joseph look like a narcissistic predator. This post on Reddit encapsulates what many are led to believe about Joseph because of the inaccurate attribution of the letter to Joseph by the church. Quote, new post, we look at Joseph Smith's happiness letter to Nancy Rigdon where Joseph sought to convince Nancy that polygamy was lawful and right and how Joseph used manipulative language to gain the consent of women. This is so damning to Joseph and polygamy, he even throws God under the bus. And quote, this is the single most damning piece of evidence against Joseph in my mind. It's tragic that so many have lost trust in the prophet Joseph because of the exceptionally low quality, fallacious evidence put forward by the church to implicate Joseph in polygamy. Once again, as we analyze the evidence presented to link Joseph to polygamy, even after 180 years and decades of intentional historical manipulation by pro-polygamy church historians, significant weakness in the quality of evidence employed by the church to blame Brigham's practice of plural marriage on Joseph continues to emerge. 